congratulations, graduates. I can't tell you how honored I am to be here with you today to celebrate your accomplishments along with my fellow honorands, President Spencer and the Bates College leadership, faculty, families, and friends. We honor your achievements today, achievements that offer a hope for the future in which knowledge and the search for understanding will play a central role. You all have spent the past few years engaged in work that has involved, at times I suspect, too little sleep, too much caffeine, a willingness to carry on despite the disappointment of a failed project or experiment, or doubts about your own place in this complex world. Maybe at times you have wondered about dedicating oneself to a chosen field or questioned your career choice, thought about other paths in life, the proverbial roads diverging in a wood. Your own perseverance, sheer stubbornness, and very importantly, the support of mentors, classmates, partners, family and friends, and maybe pets and hobbies, has led you to this moment of celebration and reflection on your accomplishments. I salute you. At such moments of celebration, we naturally reflect on how we got to this point and where we're headed from here. As I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you all today, I was reminded of something I hadn't thought about in a long time, my first public speaking experience. I was in the eighth grade, and as part of our end of year assignment in English class, each student had to present a poem to the class. I chose Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken, which seemed fitting since we were about to graduate middle school and had to make big choices like what to wear to the upcoming eighth grade dance and whether to sign up for archery or tennis lessons during summer school. My English professor father helped me practice my delivery and my cadence, and I spent hours, at least it felt like hours, in front of my bathroom mirror reciting the poem from memory. But when the day of the presentation came, and I found myself standing in front of my 30-odd classmates to deliver the poem, I couldn't get a single word out. I hyperventilated. I saw spots in front of my eyes, and I ended up whispering the poem's words in a state of near panic. Such was my first experience of public speaking. And I swore I would try to avoid a repetition, mostly by avoiding any further public speaking. <laughs> Clearly, that hasn't quite worked out for me. But over time, I came to see that instead of avoiding challenges, it's much better to meet them head on. And I wanted to share with you three specific thoughts about facing challenges and, and making choices that encompass much of my experience in science and in my life over the last few decades. The first is to trust yourself. I feel lucky that I arrived at a love of chemistry early in life and largely catalyzed by a wonderful high school chemistry teacher, Miss Wong, um, and I got inspired by other teachers at my public high school in Hilo, Hawaii, as well as the fascinating island environment of rural Hawaii where I grew up. And in fact, I remember one night uh, near the end of my senior year in high school, I was out with a friend and we got to talking about what we wanted to do when we grew up. And I sort of said flippantly, I want to be a scientist. Sounded really exotic to me, but I really hadn't the faintest clue what this would involve. My friend said, I want to run a brew pub. He had a much better idea of what that would involve, certainly with regard to the brew. Our lives took different paths, but he ended up as an award-winning craft brewmaster, and I ended up a scientist. So sometimes those very early dreams and ideas can actually come true. But of course, there were many, many bumps in my road. When I got to college, I struggled with general chemistry in my freshman year. And I found myself wondering whether I actually had what it would take to become a halfway decent 
biochemist. Discouraged after a poor performance on a chemistry exam, I went to see my beloved French teacher to ask about switching my major. What's your current major, she asked me. Chemistry, I replied. When she asked why, I described my fascination with molecules and my intense interest in figuring out how chemical properties get, govern the way living systems evolve. Without skipping a beat, she said, oh, you should stick with chemistry. And I knew in my heart she was right. That was just the first of many times when, in the face of self-doubt and setbacks, I had to trust myself and I also had to find people, supporters, who would help me get through those difficult moments. When I decided to study chemistry in college and then to pursue a PhD in biological chemistry, this was actually in the days before uh, chemical biology had been invented, it was biochemistry, my grandfather questioned my interest. What exactly is biochem, he wanted to know, and why aren't you studying to become a real doctor? I was visiting him uh, after uh, completing my first semester of graduate school in Boston, and you can imagine this was a bit disconcerting to hear this person that I deeply respected and somewhat feared uh, questioning uh, my choice of, of career path. But again, I, I knew in my heart that it was what I really wanted to do, and I felt like uh, I was doing work that I was really passionate about, and I guess I hoped in my heart that one day it would contribute somehow to improving the human condition, even in a small way. The second thought I want to share with you is about taking initiative. As Mark Twain once said, to succeed in life, you need two things, ignorance and confidence. I couldn't agree more. In my case, I started with a lot of ignorance and just barely enough confidence, more like stubbornness, to keep plugging away in the lab despite inevitable setbacks and failed experiments. And occasionally, just very occasionally, there were those precious moments when everything clicked, an experiment worked, and I had a glimmer of insight about some truth of nature and um, the feeling that I was seeing something that maybe no one else had ever seen or thought about before. Those moments kept me going as a student and they continue to keep me going as a practicing scientist today. And I found that the more I reached to work on difficult problems or tackle tricky experimental questions, the greater the sense of discovery when these occasional insights came along. Like Bates College, my academic institution, the University of California, Berkeley, offers incredible opportunities to take initiative, to get involved and explore areas about which we are ignorant, but feel sure we can contribute to. When I began teaching at Berkeley, I teach our big introductory molecular biology course, we call it Bio 1A. I met a student who was majoring in chemistry and asked if she could work in my research lab. Hired initially as a dishwasher, she soon befriended lab members who invited her to work with them on a project involving crystallization of RNA molecules. This student had no research experience and the project was challenging, but she persevered and struggled through setbacks, always with a positive attitude. And over time, I learned her personal story. She was older than most college students because she had come to her love of chemistry through work as a cosmetologist. The first in her family to attend college, she had started a career in a nail and hair salon after high school. But she found that what really caught her fancy was the chemistry of nail polish and how different chemicals interact with hair and the structure of hair proteins. She took some courses at a community college and then eventually transferred to UC Berkeley and declared a major in chemistry. And I can't tell you how thrilled I was when she graduated with a degree in chemistry from UC Berkeley summa cum laude and joined an MD-PhD program at USC to become a pediatrician. A cr incredible story of perseverance. And the amazing thing is her story is not unusual at Cal or here at Bates or many other college and university campuses across our country who are celebrating graduates this year and all of you and the amazing setbacks you've overcome and uh, incredible things that you will do in the future. We're surrounded by people who take initiative, 
not because they are unafraid, but in spite of their doubts and their fears. And finally, the third thought I want to share with you is actually a plea. It's a request that you use your talents, not just to strike out in business or teaching or starting a new company or extending your education, but also to advance public appreciation and understanding of thoughtful engagement. As a scientist, I have observed over the years an increasing distrust of science and scientists, facts becoming intertwined with alternative facts, with public support of scientific research and the scientific method itself being questioned. And I feel that at least some of the responsibility for this state of affairs lies with those of us who are scientists. For too long, we have focused our attention single-mindedly on our lab work and sharing the results of our research with like-minded colleagues. I urge each of you to step outside of narrow definition of a scientist or whatever your chosen specialty and focus in life may be, and to get involved in the broader national and international discourse about topics that you care deeply about. We must rebuild public trust in our work, and we must explain to our fellow citizens why our work matters, not just to public, publish a next academic article or make the next advance in our field, but to truly advance human knowledge and to improve the human condition and to solve practical problems like discovering new antibiotics, understanding how Alzheimer's disease develops, and developing new materials for energy conversion and storage. In my own work, I've had to step up to the proverbial plate by getting involved in discussions about the ethics of genome editing stemming from research that I conducted with my collaborator Emmanuel Charpentier and my other colleagues at UC Berkeley and with an international team of collaborators. Again and again, I've been inspired by my students and my colleagues and the community of people who support science. And I think often of my father, with whom I had a sometimes difficult relationship, but could always count on him to inquire about my work in the lab. And he would really want to know. We would discuss questions I was trying to answer and what my graduate research on the evolution of life meant for understanding our world and humans' place in it. Many years later, when faced with the profound implications of my own research on genome editing, it was dad's deep value of science and scientists that helped me take important steps to convene a global community of researchers to speak up for responsible progress in the face of rapidly moving technology. So as you all embark on your journey forward today, I encourage you to trust yourself, even in the face of the doubts of others or yourself. Take the initiative, even when it would be easier to stay on the sidelines, and get involved as spokespeople for the importance of knowledge and the facts in making our world a better place for all. Congratulations, graduates. Enjoy some well-deserved celebrations with family and friends, and go Bobcats.